on a Sunday morning. That was from Stuart Mills III. And uh, we talked about his possibility of running for Congress against uh, Congressman Nolan. And uh, as we talked, I asked him a question, why would you want to do this? And he related a story to me that uh, when he got out of high school, he wanted to join the military. And his father encouraged him to go to college and work in the family business. So he decided to honor his father's wishes and did that. And he said that it's time for him to give something back to his country. And when he told me that, I thought, it's a good reason to run. It's a good candidate to support. Somebody that's got that kind of attitude. And uh, recently I was reading an article about him in one of the magazines about his run. And uh, down at the bottom there's these, I can call them blogs or comments people put on there. It was a comment, rather sarcastic, one that says, yeah, he earned his money the old-fashioned way. He inherited it. Obviously, the writer or the person that wrote that was confused and thought that article was about Governor Mark Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to know that Stewart did own his money the old-fashioned way. He earned it, but through hard work and a good work ethic. And I know where he learned that good work ethic. He learned it from his dad, Stuart Mills Jr. Is Stuart Mills Jr. here today? He's actually working. <laughs> <laughs> he was on this morning at the office, and he was working. Yeah. And he's doing like his father did, Stuart Mills Sr. He didn't just hand the keys to the store where he made his son work. Stuart Mills Jr. made his son work. And that's where he got his good work ethic and his good business practices. In my opinion, that's the kind of person that we want in Congress. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Stuart Mills III. coming late to this party. I uh, most certainly am not a, uh, a politician, uh, but I am running for office. Uh, and actually, I am here today uh, as a guest in our own facility. I'd like to thank Paige for inviting me. I uh, remember back in January when she reached out to my father and my uncle and uh, asked, hey, we'd like to have a, uh, a rally. And my dad and my uncle said yes, and I had at that time no idea that I would be running uh, for office. Um, I would have thought that, uh, since as Dale mentioned, since I graduated from college almost two decades ago, that I'd be working the family business forever. But it's an opportunity for national service, uh, which uh, I believe in, which my family believes in, and it's, uh, it's the right time. Uh, it's the, the time that this country needs people to step forward that uh, don't uh, have a political agenda that don't have uh, career ambitions to serve in either Washington or uh, St. Paul, that it is uh, part of either state or national service. Um, and I'm here uh, underneath what is called the hunting camp doctrine. That is, whoever complains about it the most gets the job. <laughs> so those of you who are avid hunters will, will know for a certain exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, I, I don't have a stump speech, but I got a story to tell. And it's that story that I've been telling that has caused people to tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, buddy, if you feel that strongly about it, if you're that invested in it, then you know what, you better go do something about it. And you know what, they're right. And if I'm the person that can be the voice and the process that reflects the values and the priorities of Northeastern Minnesota, uh, and if you'll have me, I would love to be your candidate. Um, woo! And uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but you know, it's gonna be a beautiful day out there. and. But I, I, I want to tell you a little story about myself. A lot of people know, know me, know the Mills family. Uh, we've been in this community since the 1870s. Uh, I'm not going to uh, bore you with the, the family history. It's, it's all online. You can read it. But we, we came up uh, to the corner of uh, Gull River and 210 at the old lumber mill there. And my great-great-grandfather was the postmaster and uh, one of the managers at the lumber mill. And we put down roots, and we've been uh, engaging in family business ever since then. Uh, it's a multi-generational business. But, you know, I've seen things. I've seen things in our business. And the, the first thing that I'm going to touch on is something that's very personal to me, it's personal to you, because that's why you're here today, and that's our Second Amendment rights. But I'm in the gun business. My family's in the gun business. We have sold guns for decades. Um, and we've done it legally. And we've We've sold our guns to law-abiding citizens for protection and for hunting, and we've made no apologies for it. And 
we had a whole crop of elected officials from Obama to our senators to our congressmen who said, I believe in the Second Amendment. I will stand up for your Second Amendment rights. And then the second that they had an opportunity for political cover, they took it and lined up behind a gun control group that since 1995 has said our end game, our end game is Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. We can't get that, so we're gonna do it incrementally. We're gonna take it piece by piece by piece, and we're gonna use any political situation to our advantage. We'll say we're, we're for your guns, we'll say we're for, we're for your rights, but then when we have an opportunity, we're gonna turn on you. And it was, uh, I think that I had a responsibility in it to be a voice to call Bub Kiss on that. Because there were, there were a lot of things at play, but there were three main things at play. The first of all is that I'm a father. I have young kids. They're kindergarten age. The things that happened at Sandy Hook and some of those other uh, disasters, uh, I want to protect our children. I want to protect my children. And what they were advancing would have left our children much more vulnerable. I mean, and they were batting around all sorts of ideas about, you know, uh, federal legislation to make all schools uh, uh, gun-free under penalty of a felony. Well, the people that were perpetrating these horrendous acts, they didn't care if it was a felony. And it's like, then we walk away from it, and we think that our, our children are, are protected. Well, you know, you take a look at what we've done with fire safety since the 1950s. We've had zero, zero children die in school-related fires. Zero. But what do we do? We have fire hydrants out in front of schools. We have fire drills. We have fire alarms. We, we have fire extinguishers. We have uh, the fire department come in and give drills. I mean, because we take it seriously. Because we make it a priority to protect our children. But then when it comes to guns, it is such a, a political agenda where, where there is a political end game where they refuse to sit at a table and really come up with common sense solutions that would really protect our children. And if you want to protect our children, you have to actually physically go and protect them. There's no pixie dust, there's no magic wands, there's no good intentions, and you know, really, at the end of the day, there really is no legislation that is going to deter those people other than an actual physical deterrent. And the people that understand guns, and I know that I'm in good company because, hey, listen, you can go out here and see the business that I'm in. I understand how guns work. I understand that one gun is not morally superior or inferior to another. In the right circumstances, they are all deadly. So you don't go and say, well, this gun, because it has cosmetic uh, characteristics, is that's bad, that's wrong, that's evil. But this one that I used to hunt ducks or deer with, because it's got wood on it, that's fine, that's fine. But what they're doing is they're engaging in the Mr. and Mrs. America turn them all in a narrative of, you know what, we can't get all the guns, so let's just convince people that these are bad, even though they work exactly the same as, as this gun over here. And so I had to call bump kiss on that too. Um, it, it, and and I, I made my video, and of course, nobody has watched these videos because they only have 250 views, but I shoot competitively, and I was really proud that I had you know 200 to 300 people that watch me shoot competitively. Um, but then I put that video on there because I wanted, I, it, it wasn't a publicity stunt, it was legitimately, I wanted to reach out to Klobuchar and Franken and Nolan and to let them know that hey, this is a business that's headquartered in the 8th district in Minnesota and we employ a lot of people, uh, this is the, uh, and we have a lot of customers. This is the, the, the bread and butter of our employees which allows us to give them a paycheck and health insurance and it's also the legal activity that our customers engage in. And I see, I, uh, I, I'm very visual, I'm, I'm, I'm new media, uh, I'm multimedia. Um, I knew that if I was gonna write a letter, that it was gonna sit in the Congressional Post Office for four weeks getting scanned for anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, so I, I'm gonna, so I, I made a video. We're, listen, here's who we are, Here's who our customers, here's who our employees are, and here's the facts of how guns actually work. And I heard none. Nobody got back to me. Not a single person. 
Never heard from Rick Nolan. His office is right across the street from my office. Never heard from him. Never heard from Al Franken. Never heard from Amy Klobuchar. But it, uh, it blew me away because there's over 300,000 people that have seen that video. Uh, it wasn't a publicity stunt. Never thought in a million years that many people would watch it because the stuff where, you know, I'm shooting three gun competitively and doing good, the stuff that I really want people to see, <laughs> only a couple hundred people have seen that. But um, a little bit more about me. It's just, it's not about guns. I mean, we're, we're here to talk about guns, but I'm also a candidate for US Congress. Um, my family has been in business, like I said, for five generations. Um, and this most recent incarnation, my grandfather started back in 1922. Uh, we've been working, we've been working hard, and we've been reinvesting in our community. And when we make a profit, God willing, we reinvest it in our business. And it has gotten awful. It has gotten horrible. And I'm gonna start with something that is personal to me. And it's not a boo-boo story. It's, it's not a, a, a pity Stuart Mills or the Mills family. But I'll tell you what it is, it's offensive for anybody who operates a business or employs people. What happened in the last round of elections where you had folks saying that the wealthy, the wealthy are not paying their fair share. That there's all these loopholes and they don't pay any taxes and we have to make them pay more. Well, you know what, I'm going to speak for myself and then I'm going to allude to a few others here. You know what, we've, we've paid all of our taxes. We reinvest the money that we make into our business. We provide jobs for people. We provide health insurance for people. We are part of this community. And then beyond that, we support community and civic endeavors. We donate to charity. We, we help with events. We do a lot of things for this community. And to be singled out as a deadbeat is personally offensive. And that's what they're calling when they say you don't, oh geez, you, you know, they're, they're not paying their fair share of these, all these loopholes. Now don't feel, it's, it's not feeling bad for me, but I'm gonna ask you guys a, a favor. And, and let me go on. Um, also recently, there was uh, radio ads that were put on, I don't know if anybody's heard of them, where at the end of it was, you know, so-and-so is, is a good guy for this part of uh, Minnesota because they're making the 2% pay their fair share making the 2% pay their fair share. The, the problem with that isn't necessarily paying the fair share, it's the political pandering. Because what happens is, is that underneath the Obama administration, our taxes went from 35 to 39.6% that we're sending to Washington, D.C. Now we can talk all day long about how that money is being wasted, uh, how it's going to Solyndra, and how it's going to Fiskars, and uh, how it's going to the Obama phone lifeline program. You can go through all the waste, the fraud, the abuse, and I can carve out billions of dollars for you of how our money's being wasted. But the problem is, is that the, the, the businesses that have the ability to create jobs in northeastern Minnesota, in the 8th district, are taxed at the personal level. They're subchapter S. Their sole proprietorships, their LLCs, their partnerships, their tax at personal level. So we have Washington, our politicians in Washington and in St. Paul that is, is causing us to take money that we would otherwise reinvesting in our businesses, in our communities, and exporting it to be wasted in Washington, D.C. And then they turn around and they look, well, where are the jobs? How can we have almost at certain times of the year, not during this time of the year because we have a tourism economy, but during the off season, how can we have almost 9% unemployment? You know, and then Boise Cascade lays off a third of their workforce, Potlatch shuts down, and they look around again. How come we are not generating the jobs in northeastern Minnesota that we otherwise could? Well, I can tell you why. Because the overwhelming group of people that run businesses that have the ability to employ people are taxed at that personal rate. They are the villains. They're the bad guys. They're the ones that, quote, are not paying their fair share. They're the ones, quote, that the, the 2%, the 1%, whatever percent you want. Well, you can look around this community, and it's just not, it's just not 
you know, this, I can use myself as a personal example, um, because that, that is part of why I'm running. But there's, you know, a popular family in town that used to have a fishing magazine that now has a popular TV show. I can tell you, they pay, they pay their fair share. The guy that runs the grocery store across the street, he falls in that category. He pays his fair share. He gives to the community. He gives to charity. He invests back in his business. The guy that's got the printing company over there, and that's like he invests back in his business. He's running three shifts. He invests everything back in his business. He's growing his business. He's bringing on presses. The, but the problem is, is that we're not able to generate the jobs that we need to get people off of unemployment or to get the people that have um, given up on seeking jobs altogether off of, to, to get them back into the job search. You know, you cannot, we cannot vilify the small, medium sized, and larger sized business people anymore. We can't take shots at them. We can't call them deadbeats. And the next time you're at an event and somebody starts talking about loopholes or paying their fair share, um, please, for me, as a favor, ask them, who are they? Not Warren Buffett down in Omaha, not, not Bill Gates, who in the 8th district, or if it's a state rep, who in your district is not paying their fair share? Ask them, just say, I want you to name names. Because I can name names of everybody that is paying their fair share, that's reinvesting their business, that's given to charity, that's given to their church, that's given to their community. I can tell you who those people are. I want them to tell me by name who the people are that's getting the loopholes. Because quite frankly, I think they're lying to you. They're lying to you because they're trying to score political points and they want that quick sound bite to get people that really aren't paying that much attention to vote for them. And we need to take that away from them because it, when we're able to take that away from them, or they're, they're vilifying the folks that have the ability to create the jobs that we really need in this part of North, northern Minnesota, we'll come to the table and sit down, put the rhetoric aside, and say, listen, this is what is really going on, and this is how you really create jobs. Because St. Paul has never created a job in its entire existence, and Washington, D.C. has never created a job in its entire existence. We don't have big corporations up here. It's going to be individuals that are, are going to individuals that own businesses, that are taxed the personal rates that have the ability to do it. And we have to speak up for the, the small and the medium-sized businesses and businesses like ourselves. Because you know what? It's not only just the, the, the loop that I'm talking, but when we're able to reinvest in our business, we're able to have construction projects like this, which create construction jobs. Uh, we're the largest taxpayer in Crow Wing County. So I mean, the, our ability to pay our taxes pays for the sheriff's department, pays for everything, the city and everything else. If we want to have healthy communities, if we want to have a healthy 8th district, we have to stop kicking the people that have the ability to really grow our economy and make our quality of life better. And then the last thing I know, we've got to get out of here. It's going to be a nice day. I promised you I was going to be brief, but sorry. Um, I, I am the plan administrator and the fiduciary of our company's health care plan, the Mills Company's Employee Welfare Benefit Plan Trust. It's a mouthful, but we're a self-insured plan. Uh, we've done some very, very creative things with it. Uh, we actually came up with a uh, contribution to the reimbursement program in which we allowed our uh, employees to buy their contributions down to zero through healthy lifestyle, not smoking, right blood pressure, body mass index, you know, the, the whole uh, online health assessments exercise care. We, we came up with, with uh, six different metrics where if they engaged in all those and they were healthy, they could buy it down to zero. We were actually in, in I think a year, we had one year, maybe a year and a half, two years, but anyways, we were able to uh, rebate, actually, not only were we able to keep our costs flat, it went down and we rebated money back to our team members. And it was a great system. Uh, Obamacare happened, and uh, you know what? I can explain this to a junior high school student, and he can understand it. Any, the healthcare economy is broken down into three different uh, metrics, supply, demand, and delivery. And what Obamacare has done is it's decreased the supply of healthcare, it's done nothing to change how, how we deliver it, and it has increased the demand. And any time that happens, you're going to have costs go through the roof. And so the, the, uh, I was speaking in Duluth on Tuesday. And I said that we have the best health care on the face of the planet. And somebody stopped me afterwards and said, you know what, I disagree with you. Very nice guy. 
not combative, but really he wanted to have a, a really good dialogue, and it was a good conversation. He goes, I disagree with you. Why do you think? And I said, well, because we have uh, Canadian health ministers and the presidents of provinces that when they have something that they really need to have done that threatens their, their own life, even though they're running Canadian, the Canadian health care system, they come over here. We have people flying into the Mayo Clinic for uh, procedures from the Mideast and all over the world, heads of state. You know, that's just here in Minnesota. I mean, you take a look at what's uh, the, the New York and Florida and California. I mean, they're coming from all over the world. But our problem with healthcare is not the quality, it's access to healthcare. And somebody that has run a $34 million health plan, the Mills Companies Employee Welfare Benefit Plan Trust, it's a $34 million plan. We serve 6,000 plan participants. You do not increase access by diminishing the supply and increasing the demand. A 14-year-old can tell you that what is happening with Obamacare will not accomplish what they say they've set out to accomplish. All it will do is it will create a rationing situation, it will increase costs, it will have the opposite effect. And it, it is something that needs to be repealed and replaced by, quite frankly, just the opposite of the direction that they're going. Because it, healthcare is way more important than to have government or government bureaucrats come in between you and your doctor. It is very personal and it needs to be treated like a personal. There is improvements that can be made. There's improvements that have to be made, but they have to be made incremental because taking over one-fifth to one-sixth of our nation's economy in one failed swoop is an overreach, and it's an overreach that's going to swamp this boat, and quite frankly, they've realized it, and they're pulling back on individual components, including the employer mandate. And if any uh, anything is an endorsement of the criticism of the plan, it's the actual actions that this administration has taken because they know it's going to blow up in their face because of the train wreck. So anyways, in closing, and I, I know I'm long-winded, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a professional politician, that wasn't a stump speech, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to tell you guys who I am, why I'm running, what my issues are. Um, I believe in this country, uh, and you know, the kids here uh, remind me of my own children, and I don't want to leave $17 trillion worth of debt to any of them. Uh, our debt service is 6% of our national budget right now, and interest rates can't get any lower than where they are. They can only go up when they go back to historical rates. That $400 billion we're paying a year in interest payments is going to turn in pretty darn quick. Because, you know, first of all, the interest rates go up and we keep adding to it. We're looking at $800 uh, billion, dollars that eight, yeah, $800 billion before too long that we're going to be playing. And if we don't get to a balanced budget, uh, we're going to leave our children co a country that's going to look a lot like Greece or a lot like Cyprus. And we can't do that because we are the best country on the face of the planet. There, It is worth, worth fighting for, and there is no greater hope for liberty or freedom on the entire earth than the United States of America and that flag. So thank you for your time. Thank you.
This is a uh, 